and give you some background about the SunSpec Alliance and, uh, and generally bring you up to speed into what the opportunities are for integrating uh, smart inverters on the smart grid. All right, as I said, we're going to do a quick intro to the SunSpec Alliance. I'll take you through a solar market outlook, but by first looking back into what happened in 2013, we'll look into some trends driving the smart inverter market, and then of course outline the opportunities for you as integrators. In between, we'll be doing some question and answering, and if you have questions, uh, please make sure to pop them into the chat window, and we'll address them at the end. So the SunSpec Alliance, we're a trade alliance. We've been in business for about five years now. We have uh, approaching 70 members now, leaders in the solar industry, uh, everywhere from the component manufacturers, of course, all the major inverter manufacturers that you see uh, indicated there, a lot of the solar fleet operators, Solar City, Sun Edison, Sun Power. Uh, so we have some utilities involved, uh, balance of system operators, and, and, and of course, the systems engineers and the like. So in other words, the entire supply chain associated with producing and deploying distributed energy in the field in the U.S. and abroad. SunSpec's mission in life is to define information standards for the distributed energy industry. Historically, we come out of the information processing world. All the principals here have been involved in Silicon Valley uh, operations and businesses for the past 25 years or so. And as a result, we have great experience in terms of driving information, information standards across different industry sectors and seeing those standards turn into blossoming markets. So our work started about five years ago, and in that period of time, we've defined a complete architecture, including SunSpec specifications for most of the uh, items that you see indicated here in orange on your screen. Uh, so starting with the device models uh, to represent all the different elements of the plants. So these are informational descriptions of, of what an inverter or a meter or a panel might look like. Uh, extending there to defining standards for aggregating information at the plant and managing control signals. So this is the plant controller. Extending into the cloud for storing this information in a format that can be easily accessed uh, by applications. And then, of course, by defining application programming interfaces to do a variety of different applications, such as bulk data exchange, which you'd see in terms of a backup operation, uh, to do things like financial risk assessment. Uh, so a project that the SunSpec Alliance is doing called OSPARC, which is, stands for Open Solar Performance and Reliability Clearinghouse, uses this API to develop reports that enable investors to evaluate the, the health and the availability of the solar fleet and thus providing an indication of, of investment risk. On down into grid operations, and we see a lot of activity taking place here as distributed generation becomes a bigger part of the U.S. energy mix, uh, the need to control these assets on a fine-grained basis uh, comes to fore. And this, of course, uh, brings into the focus today's topic, which is smart inverters on the, on the smart grid. So we'll talk a lot about that. There are many other things that you can do with these applications. The point is to get the information in a standardized format so that it can be accessed by grid operations applications, uh, by the finance industry, by the owners of the assets, by the general public. And in, the, in so doing, we'll make solar energy a mainstream component of the uh, energy mix in the United States and indeed across the globe. I'd just like to uh, point out also that the, this issue of cybersecurity is very important. As we moved into a distributed environment, uh, securing the nation's uh, energy supplies it becomes of, of paramount importance. And so the, the existing grid uh, re relied on the fact that it was, it was mostly an obscure system and not too many people were interested in it. Now, of course, in our global connected economy, things are changing. So this ability to provide end-to-end -end security is really uh, essential for any uh, energy information uh, applications that are being brought to bear uh, in present time. So why does SunSpec involve itself in, in these uh, types of endeavors? Well, what we've seen is that standards across industry, they drive innovation and they increase value. Uh, standards have an effect on asset classes and markets that are really going to scale in the sense that 
with standards, you're able to drive out costs by establishing best known practices and, and, and methods for, for doing common things like communicating uh, plant equipment uh, one to the next. Uh, reducing the complexity, uh, because now, of course, if you're uh, uh, deploying to a standard, uh, you can count on an interchangeability of, of parts that allows uh, you as the consumer to, to buy on the value-added feature and not on the basic components. And with all that, you drive out risk. Now, with that solid foundation and the base, you're able to do value-added services and really drive up the, uh, the value of the solar energy asset and drive up the performance of that asset and bring more financial benefits uh, out of the asset class as a whole. So these standards, as we see them today, are being deployed across plant operations, a grid control, this is interaction with the utilities, doing risk assessment in the financial world, and we'll see many other applications as time goes on here in this robust marketplace that we're creating. Okay, so to help me gauge the rest of, of this uh, uh, presentation, uh, we'd like to ask, what is your role in the solar industry, and what are you doing in, in the business today? Let me know if you're an engineer, if you're a project developer, if you're a solar financier, you're an in information uh, processing professional, you're just interested, uh, please let us know here. All right, let's move on here by taking uh, an outlook of what's happening in the solar market today. Uh, to do that, it's always important to take a look back. Now, in the past four or five years, the solar industry in the U.S. has more or less tracked the, the global uh, marketplace. There was a significant disconnect, though, that occurred in the year 2013 when we started uh, really growing at a much faster pace than the market as a whole. You would typically think as a U.S. size share, uh, we're still now at a global share of maybe 12, 13 uh, percent. The, uh, the pace has picked up from what has traditionally had been a 5 to 6 percent global share of market, uh, more than doubled over the course of you know, 18 months to two years. And we now see a marketplace that in 2013 finished out at 13.7 uh, billion in total market size. So if you uh, can do the math, 12 percent, you're looking at a global marketplace of maybe a hundred billion dollars. Uh, now this, by most measures, is a very significant marketplace. In terms of an asset class, we're really at the beginning. Uh, so the energy infrastructure is being remade across the, the globe. There's no doubt that solar is going to be a, a very major part of that. So we're talking about uh, big numbers and, and big business. Now let's take a look at the breakdown in terms of market share. Here we saw it, show it broken out amongst the residential. That's the blue bar at the bottom. Uh, we have non-residential, which is uh, so-called commercial and industrial, and the mush market, municipals, schools, hospitals, et cetera, uh, combine that, that middle piece, and then utility taking really the lion's share. Uh, now, historically, the utility scale installations uh, have consumed many, many megawatts. To, just to quickly recap that, we got to the point where we're taking a look at a share of market, and of course, the utility market share is very significant here. Uh, we, we would expect that in coming years, the, the percentage uh, taken up by utilities will be much smaller. Uh, this is for the reason that the utility procurements that had been mandated and set aside three or four years ago have mostly been received by this point. And what we expect to see is, of course, steady gains in the residential and the commercial sectors to pick up that slack. Now, the good news about a marketplace that's operating at close to 14 billion in total global sales annual or to national sales, excuse me, is that uh, invariably you start to get some diversity. And that's what you see here. So historically, solar has been a highly regional market, whether that's a, a country by country like Germany versus Italy versus Spain, or in the U.S. context, uh, state by state. And so the, the uh, phenomenon that we see is really played out here, where you see the, the lion's share of sales coming from the top well, maybe four or five states and really with the top 14 states being those that are, are active. Now, uh, this is changing relatively rapidly because of the appeal of solar energy and the economics associated there, that even where you have states that maybe the, the policy has not been aligned to distributed generation or renewable energy uh, practices, 
uh, even those uh, states are coming along for the civil economic need. And so now we have, uh, as you see, California really taking dominant share there and with Arizona and New Jersey and so forth, uh, you know, uh, filling in behind. So a national market is forming. So we have activity across the, uh, the majority of the states now. But now with that said, uh, you also have a, a phenomenon here uh, where you have concentration really in those uh, few states that I mentioned. Uh, so if we break it down between residential and non-residential, then California on the residential side uh, maintains over half of the U.S. national market share. Uh, it, Hawaii is in second place and, and indeed deployment in Hawaii has been rapid. Uh, it is now at the point where it is starting to, to uh, uh, reach uh, where the, uh, the grid itself is being called into question in terms of can it su support the loads that, uh, that are present there. So Hawaii is actually one of the first places where we'll see smart inverters uh, deployed. They've been deployed there now for about two years. Sunspec's involved in a uh, Sunshot program to test out smart inverters in conjunction with Silver Springs Networks and with Fronius. Uh, that trial has gone uh, very well and we, we now have uh, over 200 uh, residential plants on Maui that are interconnected with smart inverters. Uh, th this is going to necessarily uh, grow as, as time goes on because of the peculiarities and the stresses on that particular grid. Uh, in some ways, you can think of Hawaii as its own grid, though. It is a, it's, an, it's an island. It's part of our, our country, but it really operates on its own grid. Now, the contiguous lower 48 really is what we'll consider to be the, the U.S. growth, uh, you know, the domestic market, if you will. And again, with California, Arizona, and New Jersey uh, handling the lion's share there and the uh, residential side. Now, non-residential is much more interesting to me, I think, from a market mix standpoint, because you have here uh, about one-third of the total marketplace being uh, represented by the, the states that aren't listed there, uh, the, the top five. And so what, what this means is this is a, a very uh, diverse market where we have uh, lots of, of trials, experimentation, and, of course, uh, uh, proven business models that are taking place in these uh, uh, outlying states. But uh, again, you have concentration in California because, of course, we're the, the solar leaders and the innovators, and New Jersey and Massachusetts because we have a, a high concentration of commercial and industrial businesses there that, that need lots of energy power. And you combine that with the fact that we have uh, good solar uh, radiation across the, these, uh, all these United States. And in fact, uh, uh, Virtually anywhere in the United States that you, you could say is, is better, at least as good at or as good as or better than what you see in the German market. Uh, Germany is situated right about where uh, uh, Anchorage, Alaska is. So as you can see here, the United States has uh, quite an advantage when it comes to solar resource. Uh, so that's the state of play here. Uh, concentration in a few states, but with lots of hope in the commercial industrial sector that will, in fact, uh, have a, a, a broad national market. Okay. Audience poll question number. So in uh, 2013, how was the how big was the U.S. market? And you have some choices here. Uh, choice number choice A was in fact uh, 1.3 billion. Choice B 3.6 billion. C 13.7 billion. Or D 73.1 billion for the U.S. market. Okay. Well, the correct answer is 13.7 billion. 56% got it right. Thank you for uh, paying attention there. Great. Appreciate it. Okay. Now that we've taken a look back, let's look forward. What are the trends driving the smart inverter market? A number one is the fact that the professional investing era has started. And so what this means is that we have reached a scale where it's interesting to Wall Street to get involved in the solar industry. And in fact, over the past two quarters, we've seen uh, four major deals that are really catalyzing the industry. Solar City did two securitizations. These are offerings of uh, secondary offerings where they bundled together solar leases. And in the case of, uh, of these two deals, about 12,000 
solar leases, these are long-term contracts and agreements to pay by solar optakers were bundled together and asset-backed securities were issued. Uh, solar City did two of those and was able to dramatically improve their borrowing rates. Uh, NRG, which is the diversified independent power producer, issued shares for a yield co called Energy Yield Co. And uh, that has done very well as an offering. It's doubled in price. Of course, the, the yields have come in as expected. Uh, this is, again, uh, offering a, a way for the industry to, in this case, to, to bundle up close to a billion dollars worth of assets and uh, attract uh, investors into a, a safe investment uh, that uh, uh, provides yields that are uh, commensurate with uh, a uh, established asset class. And Sutton Edison is following suit with NRG. They're building their own yield co, and that is still in the pipeline, uh, but the uh, indications are that it too will do very well, where they'll bun bundle together uh, many commercial PPAs and so forth, and then uh, flow to a public offering for that. So they, the big money has definitely taken notice of the solar industry which is good because the industry needs a ton of capital. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, working through the National Renewable Energy Labs, has been researching the capital needs of the distributed energy market. And in the end of 2013, they published this paper uh, showing the capital needs for wind and solar. Uh, so you can see that historically, solar has played a small fraction of the uh, overall capital needs. But looking out into 2020 and beyond, we see almost half the capital flowing to the PV marketplace. I think this proves the effectiveness of the technology. But in terms of total terms, we're looking at a market need of approaching $35 billion a year in the year 2020. So that's roughly three times bigger than the marketplace that we have today. And so. Yes, that's, the, that's a lot of money and, and that the industry will need to, to keep growing and developing uh, as expected. Uh, there's a lot of money to be had. Uh, in, in terms of the global investment picture, we see a large amount of money on the sidelines in terms of pension funds, mutual funds, uh, private wealth. And we're maybe talking about many tens of trillions of dollars sitting on the sidelines. Uh, because in the past they felt that the available investments were too risky for, for them. Now, as solar establishes itself, it has been able to attract insurance funds and private equity and to, to bring that to, to bear, at least in limited amounts, you know, to the investment class here. Uh, but untapped are pension funds and the private wealth that I indicated. Uh, so if those sources could be unlocked, uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, again, many tens of trillions. Uh, 50 to uh, to 100 trillion dollars uh, in total investment that could be available to this asset class, and the implication of that is profound. Uh, today we see a borrowing costs for commercial and industrial borrowers that range uh, coincidentally from between about 18 to 16 percentage points. Now, what this slide talks to is public capital vehicles uh, lowering the overall uh, levelized cost of energy by 8 to 16 uh, percent. But just again, so coincidentally, the, uh, the borrowing rates for solar developers are in the double digit range. Now by tapping these public capital sources, uh, we can lower borrowing rates very uh, significantly. For example, in the Solar City deal, their typical cost of borrowings were 7 percent. Now that's reflected of their leadership in the industry. Now with their securitization, they were able to borrow now at four and three quarters percent. So what this equates to is uh, 50 cents uh, per watt installed at residential scale. And uh, that type of pricing change is, is bound to bring uh, elastic, elasticity and open solar up to uh, many other borrowers. Uh, so the, the point is that the industry needs capital source. The capital can be had at lower interest rates assuming that we can be forthcoming and have the transparency required to operate as an industry to share information. So this is where the information standards come in. Okay, so we have these capital sources that are out there. Uh, we have uh, an industry that's interested and now what we face in 
in terms of technological development is a need to cross a chasm. So what this slide illustrates is that really uh, government's role in the early stages, and entrepreneurs' roles in terms of uh, bringing to bear technologies to fuel the early part in development, uh, followed by the VC portion. We're now invested in the uh, private equity portion. Uh, so these investors have come in. But now the marketplace, and, and so we, we're now going from a speculative arena to where the industry source is going mainstream. And here's where uh, we face a, a financing gap. So we need to have different types of vehicles. And again, here's where the, the uh, public capital uh, can come in. But now this transitional assistance is needed. Renewable Energy Labs is working in this space as well on an initiative called Solar Access to Public Capital. Uh, this Solar Access to Public Capital initiative today has uh, uh, over uh, 250 organizations involved, including the, uh, the nation's leading banks, project developers, uh, legal firms, uh, independent engineering firms, etc. cetera. Uh, these, the, the people that are responsible now for putting uh, solar projects on, on roofs and, and into operation, uh, all the main players are here. We're collaborating. Uh, I invite each and every one of you on uh, this call to, to join in as well if you have the, the time, the expertise, the resources to, uh, to do so. It's really a, a great opportunity to work as an industry to develop these new financing sources at, at better and lower cost. Uh, so this, again, is a, is a factor that's leading up to and driving the solar market. And so this brings us into focus uh, on the, the topic at hand which has to do with uh, smart inverters and opportunities. Now, so things are looking good on the finance side. So what's happening operationally? Uh, the California Independent System Operator at a recent conference this spring uh, showed this chart. And indeed, it is a, a complex chart. But what it shows is the effect of solar energy. So that's the uh, yellow line. okay? And what this does to uh, demand, overall demand on the grid. And so with, without uh, solar, uh, we could uh, have, have well expected to see the sort of blue line here, right? But the fact that we have solar means that demand during the middle of the day drops pretty significantly uh, because it's filled in by solar. Now, the sun sets every day. So as that sun sets, what happens is the solar resource goes offline. It can no longer produce power. But meanwhile, we have people coming home and they're drawing energy. So what's the utility and grid to do to supply all this needed power? 12.7 gigawatt hours are needed to be put onto the grid in the course of three hours. And so what this, this, what this shows is that there is a, uh, there's a real impact on, on conventional resources because of the uh, oncoming of solar. We see a decline in the need of conventional resources, at least during the middle of the day, but of course, we still need to have this generating capacity in the afternoon. And so what smart inverters can do when combined with storage is take this top part that you see right here, which is the peak of energy produced in the day, store it in the battery, and potentially move it over to this section. And what that will do is, uh, first of all, open up opportunities for entrepreneurs to take this part of the peak and move it to the right by two or three hours. Uh, that has tremendous value. It also allows them to compete in a marketplace uh, where peak premium prices are being paid because these are, uh, are points of uh, most stress on the grid and so therefore delivering the highest value. So this particular opportunity, again, fairly complex, but the, the basic idea here is that with smart inverters, you can take the excess energy that is not needed during the day shift it over to time that is needed, and extract value as a result. Uh, very, very interesting opportunity. Coming on in 2020, uh, California Independent System Operator really doesn't know uh, how they're going to handle uh, this, or they didn't know as of about to, uh, a year ago, but they've been planning uh, very significantly for, for this event and are now opening up legislation such that these marketplaces can be opened up. Okay. So that's what's happening on the independent system operator side. Now, what's happening on the customer side of the meter? Well, the customer side of the meter, and this is 
the, the typical net metering applications that you see in California. So if your neighbor has solar or if there is a Costco or a Walmart in your neighborhood that has solar, uh, those are typically operating on the customer side of the meter. And those installations are governed by a California Energy Commission rule called California Rule 21. Uh, so the, the state of California, like a, a lot of the states, has a, a special administrator that sets the rules and regulations for uh, bringing power sources onto the grid. In this case, Rule 21 defines how distributed generation plants, in this case solar, can be connected. Uh, for the first time ever in 2014, 2014 Rule 21 will be amended uh, to allow smart inverters. Up until now, if anything untoward would happen on the grid, inverters were told to trip off. Uh, and this worked uh, well early on when there was relatively little solar. It did not look so, work so well as penetration rates have become higher. Because effectively, when the inverters and the solar systems trip off, it's uh, effectively the same as if a, a large uh, a big box store were to turn on all the lights at once. So you have this tremendous ebb and flow taking place on the grid, which causes all sorts of imbalances and, and makes your lights flicker and does all sorts of, of bad things. So what Rule 21 does, it says, well, we can't have that. So it, things are going to be dynamic on the grid, and, and so we need to be able to uh, react to changing market conditions on, and technical conditions on the grid to allow ride through uh, of, of these solar plants during those cases. So. Smart inverters are being introduced to help support the grid. This will then enable new revenue streams that I highlighted on the previous slide. And California being a leader globally, what we're doing here with Rule 21 will be used as a template to extend across the rest of the 50 states of the United States. So all this is, bodes well for entrepreneurs who are willing to take risks and, and make things happen uh, now. So once you decide to jump in, what sort of opportunities can, will you see? So what will be the commodities that can be bought, sold, traded, and operated, et cetera? California Independent System Operator, in that same presentation, suggested some high-value services that, that they thought would be coming on fastest. And this had to do with things like fast ramping. So for example, when the sun sets, we need to have an incentive that lets batteries discharge very rapidly to help support the, the grid. That's called fast ramping. Uh, we have regulation services for current and voltage. If we have all these generators coming on and uh, offline, we need to have a way to uh, provide harmony there. Uh, likewise for voltage, frequency response, and, and the like. So these are see, seen as sort of the, uh, the near-term uh, commodities, if you will, services that are needed to support the grid. Now, uh, you also see some uh, other types of, of operations that, that are possible. For example, load shifting. Load shifting is interesting to the independent system operator. It's also interesting to the commercial business owner uh, who pays high peak demand charges for the uh, electricity. So what I'm implying here is that independent of opportunities with the independent system operators, you have opportunities with individual business owners to shift their, their load to take advantage of lower cost electricity. Uh, and there, there are other applications as well, uh, but that's probably a good place to start. The point is that there's a strong technical need, uh, there's an awareness of the problem in the marketplace, and there, in, uh, there are incentives being put in place, and there's the technology that is coming online uh, to address those conditions and help build this market. SunSpec is also playing, of course, a broad role in this industry. We're working with EPRI, which is the Electric Power Research Institute. This is a research institute representing the utilities of the United States. They, are, they provide their advanced R&D. So they're operating as a prime contractor to the California Energy Commission. SunSpec is taking leadership on both the technology side and the market deployment side on this project to deploy smart inverters into the grids of Southern California, Edison, and SMUD, and at the same time develop a testing protocol for smart inverters so that uh, we can evaluate commercial inverters to a, a new standard uh, for, uh, for intelligence for their ability to react to changing energy, energy conditions 
and uh, along with that provide the communications interfaces that are needed to manage and control these devices. So we're developing a, a test uh, to uh, facilitate all that in conjunction with underwriters labs which will ultimately codify that and and then allow manufacturers to be tested against that standard. So that's the technical work that we're doing. Uh, in terms of the demonstration, what we'll be able to show is that market signals, for example, a request coming over a trading network uh, to provide load following or load shifting operations uh, will be sent to a plant. Uh, those signals will be translated into a technical controls then it will then you know, make the uh, make the local solar system uh, do something like direct its load or provide frequency regulation or pr provide those ancillary services that we had listed. Uh, storage is not included here, it, it, so the load following is not possible here, but the other uh, services that I mentioned certainly are all available and will be demonstrated through this combination of market signals and uh, technical signals. Now, th the reason we're doing this project is to really take it to the next step. Uh, we have the requirements, we have the test protocols, but now wh what can be done to actually deploy this stuff into the field and how can we do it at scale? So that's what this project will, will prove out. Uh, so this project started in February, it will go on for about the next year or so and, and provides this, this proving ground uh, for smart inverters in the, uh, in the grid. All right, so those are some opportunities in broad strokes, but what are the specific opportunities that you might see here? Uh, Number one is early smart inverter projects. So the, uh, the, the regulation, the Rule 21 regulation, were, is expected to be ratified and finalized literally any day now. So what this means is in the fall time frame, uh, by cooperating with the utility, an integrator will be able to deploy smart inverter projects in the field. Uh, so again, it, because this is a permitted application, it has to be done in cooperation with utilities, but that is an opportunity, I think, for you uh, to, to ally with them. Uh, in the process, the, the, the early innovators here will define these revenue models that others will that later on copy and, and bring to scale. Uh, but what this does for you as a, an entrepreneur in this field is to showcase your expertise and really set yourself up as, as being an experienced person and what is a rapidly developing and evolving market. Uh, given that we're co-hosted with uh, MOXA, I thought it would be important to identify the computing opportunities here as well. And what we see with uh, smart inverters is a, a makeover of the grid where we'll have two-way control uh, between the operators, owners of the plants and, and the utilities themselves. And so this means that there's a need for these uh, plant controller applications to resolve uh, all sorts of interesting uh, differences like uh, how do you manage a situation where you have two, uh, two, two potential influences on a single plant and how does the market mechanism work. Uh, but in any case, the, the need for IT uh, expertise and indeed equipment uh, throughout these types of, of networks is, uh, is also a big opportunity. Uh, perhaps the biggest opportunity of, of all that emerges from this combination of smart inverters and computing and changing uh, grid environment is the opportunity for PV and storage. California has recently mandated that uh, uh, 1,325 megawatts of storage will be purchased between now and 2020. Uh, the procurements have started already. Uh, 2015 is expected to be a, a pretty significant year uh, and, and really the, the, the start of that rollout. So uh, it's not too early to start here. Much to the benefit of the industry, Cal ISO, just within the last two weeks, has issued a ruling saying that they're opening a market for flexible ramping to address that opportunity that I showed you uh, earlier. So in other words, there's pricing available for this commodity. So if you can build your project to address this opportunity, there's money to be made on these projects now. Opportunities that we see coming down the, the line in terms of PV and storage has to do with uh, taking advantage both of uh, production volume and market maturity uh, economics associated with batteries, and then combining that with the fact that electric vehicles, as they come online uh, and, and uh, go through their battery life, well, what results is a battery that probably 
still has 80% of its uh, available capacity that can then be deployed into photovoltaics. It's anticipated that these types of storage devices can be uh, acquired at a fraction of their original cost, and this is going to lead to, to some really uh, I interesting uh, growth dynamics uh, in the PV and storage solution sector. All right, so thank you for your time and attention here today. So the, the smart inverter era has definitely started. Uh, it's been building for several years now. It really got started in, in Europe about two or three years ago uh, was, were the first applications of this technology. Uh, the need for it is here and now in the United States. The opportunities are well identified. Uh, the, the ability to deploy solar and storage to serve multiple masters, both utilities and the energy optakers, is now possible. Uh, this will lead to new revenue and service opportunities for all and really forces the industry to cooperate with utilities to help build out the nation storage and energy infrastructure. And it's really an exciting time to be in this marketplace and I certainly encourage all of you, if you have not entered the marketplace, to take a strong look at it and, and those of you that are in the industry to, uh, to, to you know, hold together to develop these standards that are going to, to lead to an even bigger marketplace in the future. All right, and with that, we'll open it up to questions and answers. All right, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, like Tom just mentioned, we're going to open up for some questions here. So, um, Tom, I do have one here from Mindy. Uh, Mindy asks, what is the relationship between energy storage and smart inverters? And I'll pass it back to you. Great. Yeah, well, the relationship between energy storage and smart inverters well, that's a, that's a good one. It, it's a relationship that goes back to the uh, to really the birth of the solar industry in the U.S. And, and probably globally. At the beginning of the industry, there were virtually no PV systems that did not have batteries. Uh, but these were, of course, used in, in off-grid applications. The pendulum swung the other way over the ensuing years. And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, for the, about the last 10 years, the significant fraction of the marketplace has had no batteries whatsoever. Now, in the future, I would expect to go back in the other way uh, to where we'd see almost uh, no PV installations that wouldn't have some element of, of storage. Another thing that batteries and PV have in common, specifically the lithium ion batteries, they think similar economics. Uh, and by that, we've seen lithium ion batteries be uh, reduced in, in price by about half over the past three years. Uh, experts believe that we'll see similar declines over the coming three years. And those are economics that are very similar to what we see in photovoltaics. And uh, so these are, are two technologies that do go well together. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is from Steve. Uh, Steve asks, can you provide specific examples of revenue streams from Rule 21 integration of smart inverters to integrators? Sure. Yeah. So specific revenues that are available to integrators. Well, these are integrators, I think, and and uh, project developers. So if you have, uh, you're, if you're able to maintain uh, in equity and, and and or operating interest in these plants, which is a, a sort of a, a unique characteristic of the energy business model, this is, ends up being very common. But if you are are situated in that arena, what this allows you to do is strike really two contracts. One with the energy offtaker to produce the kilowatt hours, you know, the power that, that generates the light, uh, that, that keeps the lights on, and have a second contract with your local utility uh, to provide things like frequency regulation, uh, voltage control, and as we saw here, uh, load falling applications. So, and, and this is available both, I think, into Rule 21, uh, so customer meter side of, of the uh, uh, equation as well as those that are directly connected to the distribution grid and are subject to the uh, federal regulations such as those that are seen uh, within the Cal ISO environment. So in both, uh, in both marketplaces there are opportunities for ancillary services today. Great. Uh, the next question we have is from Adele. Adele asks, 
Um, how can supercapacitors be integrated with distributed residential PV utilization, utilization schemes, um, and can they be used uh, for DSM by utilities? Um, there's also a follow-up question here. Uh, Adele also wants to know, can these be integrated as part of super inverters? So if you need me to repeat that, Tom, sure. I can, but uh, um, go no, for it. No, I think I got the gist of it. So, in other words, how can really big things like supercapacitors be combined with really small things like residential PV installations to cooperate and provide these services that we've been talking about today? And uh, the answer, Adele and others out there, is that they certainly can and, and are uh, being integrated together. It, it, typically, in, in terms of, of, of substation or uh, distribution sided uh, uh, supercapacitors and other, other forms of storage, uh, being located in an area where we have high concentrations of solar. So they're proximate enough that on, on aggregate you can provide these, these types of, of regulation and, and ancillary services. So the, the interesting thing about the deployment is you actually end up in two different types of deals, you know, big deals around the supercapacitors done directly with the utility, and of course, of course lots of little contracts done uh, with the residential solar operators. And with the aggregation point of, of, of being the uh, independent system uh, operability to what's happening on, on both sides of that equation, it can then make the economic uh, or take the economic judgment to determine uh, particular levels of the investment on either side. Great. Uh, the next question is from Alex. Uh, I think Alex is over in Europe. Um, because he's asking, Europe has had smart inverters for years. He wants to know what's the big deal. Yeah, you know, the smart inverter manufacturers in Europe are sort of saying the same thing. Hey, what's the big deal with smart inverters in the U.S.? And so I think it's, a, it's an accurate portrayal. Now, uh, really the issue is that the, the equipment, the manufacturers have the ability to service these needs to uh, to provide variable power sources and, and differentiate and tease out different attributes. Uh, but however, the, the regulations that you see in every market tend to be somewhat different. And, and the U.S. and the uh, uh, European energy markets do in fact operate differently. Just the, the, the uh, feed-in tariff versus net metering alone causes some operational uh, differences. So. The, the main point here is that we need to have a local scheme, a U.S. local scheme, uh, for providing management and control. We haven't had that. And we also have particular operating characteristics for our, our grid. We operate at different uh, uh, frequencies. So we have to prove out that the equipment can operate at, at our frequencies, for example. Uh, so these are fine-tuning uh, issues, but there are the, the necessary issues that industry has to get through to open up a broad market. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, the next one's also from Steve. Yes, again, what is the timeline for rollout um, of smart inverters in the U.S.? Tom, let me know if you got that question. If not, I can repeat it. Um, again, it's... Oh, I, got, I definitely I got it. Uh, okay. I definitely got it. I was on mute. Okay, no okay. worries. Thank you. So the, the answer to that question is that the, uh, the smart inverter era starts when the judge uh, makes the Rule 21 ruling. Uh, that's expected any day, so that, that means that uh, this fall, the smart inverters will be allowed uh, on the grid. Now, the work that's being done now to devise these testing standards and protocols that SunSpec is working on with, with EPRI, that work is, is uh, taking place over the next six months. And so what this means is that the national testing agencies will have these tools in their hands during the first part of 2015. And so given natural production cycles, we'll start to see higher volume uh, deployments in about a year or in the third or fourth quarter of 2015 with the main market kicking in in 2016. So essentially we're, we're about, we're in that period where we're getting initial deployments, uh, teasing out the, the bugs, defining the deployment scenarios, and then moving to a volume in about 12 months. 
Great, thank you. Um, the next question uh, comes from James, and he's asking, how do solar plant operators get paid for supplying ancillary services to the grid? Right, the solar plant operators get, get paid in a couple of different ways. Uh, number one is you have a state and federal government regulating bodies, Rule 21 and, and, and FERC, which governs CalISO, that define these different product services. And so this, uh, this flexible ramping product that I described earlier uh, is, is one of those products. So a solar plant operator would get paid by striking a contract uh, with CalISO to provide flexible ramping services. And then, of course, building a plant to provide those services. The, the second answer to how does, does the uh, solar developer get paid for providing ancillary services is by taking advantage of uh, market dynamic in the commercial industrial sector. In the commercial industrial sector, those, those uh, energy consumers pay premium prices because they're operating at, at higher tiers of pricing uh, for, for peak rates. And so by simply shifting their peak loads, distributing it uh, throughout the day, uh, they can save lots of money. And in fact, the, uh, the industry has estimated that there's about a three to four year payback for deploying the combination of solar and, and, and PV in these industrial field, uh, fields and then helping these companies uh, avoid uh, peak charges by doing load shifting. And so those, those are at least two different reasons, two different marketplaces that are coming together in the future, but there's uh, two places to, to apply uh, your, your work today and to get paid uh, for providing these services. Great, thanks for that insight uh, there, Tom. And it looks like this is our last question, unless we get one to come in. Uh, but the last question, when is the requirement for data communications being phased in? And that is from Lauren. Okay, Lauren, thanks for asking that question. The question of data communications is, is something that's, uh, you know, of course, very near and dear to the hearts of SunSpec. And so we predicted that information standards would, would be a, a driver in this field you know, some time ago. That's why we started our work. And uh, we, we see it's, it's now from finally coming to, to bear. So smart inverters today need to be able to communicate with an outside entity to receive the commands to make the smart inverter do different things to provide uh, fast ramping or to provide voltage support, et cetera. So you need data communications for that. Now, I think the question is, when is a standard going to be required in the state of, of California uh, to interact with all these interconnected systems? And the answer to that is that this comes in with the phase two requirements of Rule 21. And, and so uh, the, the requirement for data communication starts again in about a year and then with another year for rollout. Uh, so at, at that point, you'll have a, a commonality for control systems throughout. Incidentally, at the inception, I think you'll see a, a large degree of commonality just simply by the fact that uh, vendors are picking up on the SunSpec protocols and are, are implementing them today. So we're involved in these early installations as well. But thanks for that question. And Tom, uh, can't let you have to hook that easy. We've got a couple more that just came in. Um, this first one is from Alan. Um, he's asking, we're just looking at inverters here, but as uh, PVs get more efficient, how does this skew the revenue market um, for the service provision? Uh, okay, well, okay, so c can you try that one again? So as we have a growing market, at different uh, pressures on Manufacturers, what are the opportunities and service? Is that the question? Yeah, it's it's. Um, he wants to know how does this, you know, how does the when when we're looking at inverters and and photovoltaics, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. how does this skew the revenue market um, for service provision? Got it. Okay. Well, the need for services has, of course, always been there, but the the. the uh, uh, the, the obvious requirement for it is now being acutely felt at, with professional investment. So professional investment is asking the question, well, if, I, if I'm going to receive my revenue stream over 20 years, who will be operating and maintaining that plant over 20 years? And so 
the industry has, has had an incomplete answer to that question up until now. It's been forced to come up with a very solid answer uh, backed by strong economics. So with the Solar Access to Public Capital Initiative that I mentioned that SunSpec is involved in, we've been defining uh, standards for O&M, including standard cost models. So what this means is we believe that operations and maintenance providers will be fairly compensated for providing a comprehensive and standard set of services across the, the nation's fleet. Uh, O&M is a tricky business in distributed generation for the reason that most of these power plants are unmanned. They, are, they, they don't have personnel on site, so which means that you're doing most of your work from afar. And, uh, and then, of course, only deploying a truck roll to go make repairs when absolutely necessary because truck rolls are very expensive. So what this means is this is, provides incentives for, for people to be highly efficient, highly automated, and have a really good understanding of the cost model. But if you fit that profile, then you can be fairly compensated in a marketplace that is, is now expected this year probably to double in terms of the total uh, installation count uh, overall. And so uh, given that context, there's, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. Uh, so really that I, is, I, th I think represents another opportunity. I didn't list it up as a primary one, but it's probably in the category of uh, top five opportunities in this business. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and looks like we'll, we'll have one more question. Uh, this one from Eli, he asks, is there any information related to solar investments for Mexico? Um, will the integration of inverters be the same? Okay, is there information about investment in solar in Mexico? Yes, by, by all means, there, there is. I can point you to uh, a number of resources in that uh, realm. And the requirements for smart inverters in Mexico will not be exactly the same because the grid's different and um, it has its own unique characteristics. But by the, the same token, the, the types of services that will be needed to support the Mexican grid uh, will be very similar to those of Germany, Italy, or the United States. So, but again, the market ne mechanism uh, will be different. I do anticipate that the communication protocols that are used throughout the, uh, the, the global arena will be the same. So what we have in common with Mexico, with Europe, and the United States is that underlying the communication standardization uh, is, is, is an international standard called IEC 61850. And so there is commonality uh, across the, the various marketplaces. And so SunSpec has an interest in all of these grid integration uh, markets. We're lined with 61850. We're not currently working with, uh, with, uh, with Mexico partners per se. We are working with suppliers that service Mexican markets. Uh, those uh, Mexican markets are anticipated to use similar technologies. And now next issue is how does it get implemented in terms of the rules and regulations. Uh, so Green Tech Media had a, a, a great session in their last uh, solar summit about the Mexican marketplace. It, it is a, a case where regulation will be coming there within the next 12 months. So, so watch this, this space. Uh, and uh, so I would expect it to evolve in a similar fashion, but the script is not yet written for Mexico. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, and with that, you know, we'll go ahead and, you know, uh, begin to end this webinar. So, so again, thank you, Tom, and thank you to everyone for your interest and participation. Um, also, I uh, want to let each of you know that you'll be receiving a uh, follow-up email with both the webinar recording and presentation slide deck. Lastly, please take a minute before logging off to fill out our survey as we really value your input and feedback. And thank you again for tuning in, and uh, have a great rest of the week, everyone. Thank you.